go ahead and give thanks to the Lord for the privilege of digging in. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you again for the joy of being able to open the Word of God, your Word, Lord, and help us to, every time we do that and say that, realize what we're doing. We're opening, opening sacred scripture. What you, our creator and our redeemer, have revealed to us. Thank you for this tremendous epistle to the Romans that for centuries has blessed the church of God and those that love the Lord in, in rich ways. And I pray that we would understand your mind as revealed through the Apostle Paul and through this letter that we're studying tonight. Bless us tonight, Lord. Help us to be um, engaged so that we can understand the truth of your word. And I pray that, as always, that we would be intent on being doers of it, not hearers only. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, let's open our Bibles to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And we're going to try to finish up Romans chapter 5 tonight. And <clears throat> we'll jump into another section. But as always, we, <clears throat> we go back to the key thought that seems to permeate this letter. And that is the key verse. Or verses. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. We've spent time in Romans 1 to 3, and now we're in a righteousness from God is provided. And here is the outline of this section, the righteousness of God provided. You'll notice, and I don't have this in your notes because I, I think I had it there last week. But anyway, um, We've looked at chapter 3, verses 21 to 31, where Paul teaches three basic truths about justification by faith. Then chapter 4, verses 1 through 25, Paul illustrates justification by faith alone through the old, from the Old Testament. Mainly Abraham, but also David, the, 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 the uh, law and the prophets. And then chapter 5, this is, by the way, the first section there, the first half. You'll notice the box. That's, that's uh, Paul illustrates justification by faith from the Old Testament. 1, 2, 3, and 4 there, we've already dealt with, so I didn't fill it in. So um, you have it in your other notes. We're in chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Paul explains the experiential results that justified people enjoy. Okay? And having explained the need for justification and the way of justification, the apostle now describes its fruits or blissful consequences. It appears he's enlarging on what he called the blessedness of those whom God justifies. One, the first one we looked at last week, we have peace with God. I'm not going to elaborate on that tonight because we've already dealt with that we have peace with God and as a result we can have peace with others we can have the peace of God and ultimately there will be peace on the earth when the prince of peace comes number two another blessing blissful consequence is we rejoice in our future we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God and then thirdly, we didn't get through all of this, and this is where we're at. We rejoice in our sufferings. We rejoice in our sufferings. We, we first of all began with a definition um, of that Greek word philipsis, which has to do with suffering, affliction, tribulation. It comes from a verb which means to crush, 
to press, to compress, to squeeze, like that of a press, squeezing the fluid from olives or grapes. It's that idea of pressure. It includes, this word includes the sufferings that are common to all men and women, of course, living life in a fallen world. I mean, ill health, aging, poverty, loss of loved ones and friends, death that we will experience, trials and tribulations, losing jobs, just, just, just hard. We, 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 we experience the sufferings that are common to everyone living in this fallen world. But there's also a second thing. And that is the sufferings unique to Christians. Unique to Christians. Christians are not exempt from tribulation. Justification doesn't protect us from that. In fact, Christians are especially subject to it. And their tribulation consists largely in persecution and the opposition their testimony meets in this unfriendly world. Okay? Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. He said, if they hated me, and they did, they'll hate you because you're associated with me. Paul told the new believers in Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of heaven. Paul wrote to Timothy, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. So, that's the definition. Now, I think we ended up here uh, pretty close here. We're almost there. Question, what attitude should Christians adopt, adapt or adopt to these sufferings? Far from enduring them with stoic fortitude, we are to rejoice in them. That's what he says. We rejoice in our sufferings to exalt, to glory, to boast. This is not being masochistic. It, masochism is the sickness of finding pleasure in pain. That's not what we're talking about here. But in our trials, there's a recognition that there is divine rationale and purpose behind it. Okay, so that's why this is important. There's divine rationale and purpose. Um, so, uh, suffering, by the way, is, one and, is the one and only path to glory. So what do you mean by that? Well, it was so for Jesus. That's how, you know, he came into this world. But his life, especially his public ministry, was one of rejection, conflict, and ultimately suffering that led to the cross. So his path to glory was hardship, was suffering from his enemies. Even though he was a righteous, godly, sinless person. The God-man. It was so for Christ. It is so for Christians. As Paul will soon express it, we are co-heirs with Christ if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we also may share in his glory. Look at chapter 8, verse 17. Chapter 8, verse 17. Now, if we are children then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. That's what I mean by suffering is the path, one and only path to glory. And so that's why we, we rejoice in them both. Not only do we rejoice in the hope of glory, but also we rejoice in our sufferings because they're the path to glory. That's why in Acts chapter 5, verse 41, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. I think of what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 4. He, he, he wrote this, 1 Peter chapter 4, 
uh, 12 and 13, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Suffering is the pathway to glory. So that's something that the church has experienced uh, for a long, long time during this church age. Secondly, here's the other one, point B. If suffering leads to glory in the end, what about right now? Well, right now it leads to maturity in the meantime. For the believer, suffering works for him, not against him. And that's what Paul meant when he said in Romans chapter 5, the passage we're looking at, he says, we rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. So there's, there's a sanctification, maturing, growing into Christ's likeness, into trust and dependence that comes through that in our lives. So that's something we need to keep in mind. So let me give some principles here um, as we start to wrap this up, okay? Uh, this one point. Principles. Every trial we face is allowed by God for our ultimate good. Every trial we face, point A, is allowed by God for our ultimate good. That's what uh, Romans 8.28 says. We know that in all things God works for the good of those that love him. So, every trial we face is allowed by God for our ultimate good. And that's where we get, that's, here's another one, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation, that is no trial, no testing, has seized you, overtaken you, except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tested, tried, beyond what you can bear. But when you are tested, tried, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. So every trial we face is allowed by God for our ultimate good. Secondly, trials do not need to steal our joy. Trials do not need to, trials need not steal our joy. You know, there's a, I have a commentary on the book of Philippians. It's one of the Warren Wearsby's commentaries on the B series. Okay, you know, that all, he has all those B series. And, he, and the one on Philippians is called Be Joyful. And his opening chapter is, is introduction to the book of Philippians. He, said, he talks about the joy stealers. And he outlines the four chapters of Philippians by saying, what are the thieves that rob you of your joy. What are the thieves, thieves, thieves that rob us of our joy? The joy stealers. Chapter one, circumstances. Paul talks about, you know, brothers, I want you to know that, that the things that have happened to me have really turned out to advance the gospel. But circumstances can be joy stealers. Chapter two, people. People. If you read chapter 2, you'll see why that is so. There were some issues there in Philippians. Chapter 3, things. And then chapter 4, worry. Those are the joy stealers, thieves that rob us of our joy. But trials do not need or need not steal our joy. I'm not talking about giddy happiness, but genuine joy in the Lord. They do not need to steal it. Number three, God, God is never more present than when his children are suffering. God is never more present than when his children are suffering. And yet sometimes we think he's not present. He's left us, right? Um, but he has not. God is never more present than when his children, whom he whom he bought, whom he loves, who are in his family, are going through suffering. 
If you believe that God exists to make you comfortable, I'm talking about me too. If we believe that God exists to make us comfortable, then you will find him very absent in your discomfort. If we believe that God exists to make our life run smoothly, then you will find God very absent when your life hits a rocky path. If you believe that God exists to make you happy, then you will find God absent when your heart is broken and tears are flowing. If you believe or if we believe that God exists to make us holy, then in the midst of the trial, you will feel his arms around you. And here's number one, two, and three, and four. Look, the Lord, he is an experienced sufferer fellowshipping with us. He is, God is never more present than when his children are suffering. He is an experienced sufferer fellowshipping with us. As Peter wrote to Christians who are undergoing persecution, hardship, he says, if you are insulted for the name of Jesus, if you are insulted because you bear that name, he says, rejoice because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Think about that. The spirit of glory and of God rests on you. God is not absent. He's present. He's an experienced sufferer fellowshipping with us. Point B, or two, the Lord is an attentive counselor listening to us. He's an attentive counselor listening to us. James 1.5 says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, and it will be given to him. And by the way, James 1.5 comes after James 1, verses 2 through 4. It's in the same context where it says, if you experience trials, we're to rejoice in those. And then he says, if anyone of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. So he's an attentive counselor listening to us. Uh, number three, he is a loving father training us. A loving father training us, growing us. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 says this. My son, do not make light the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart. Because the Lord disciplines or trains those he loves. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. So he goes on and talks about that. And discipline doesn't mean punishment. It means training. So he's a loving father training us. And lastly, he is a faithful friend sustaining us. He is a faithful friend sustaining us. And 2 Corinthians 12, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. So, just some principles to take from that third blessing. We have peace with God, we rejoice in our future, and we rejoice in our sufferings. We spent some time on that. Here's a fourth one. Number four, we are eternally secure in Christ. He says in, the, in verse five, and hope, this hope that we have, the hope of the glory of God... And hope does not disappoint us. The New Living Translation tr says, says it this way. Um, and this hope will not disappoint us. In other words, the hope of the glory of God we will come, we will not be disappointed. In other words, we're secure eternally. It will not disappoint And that's something that's really, really important in verses 5 through 11. In other words, it won't. To, to be sure, we are often profoundly perplexed by tragedies and calamities of life, but our hope of future glory will never disappoint us by proving to be an illusion after all. That will never happen. 
How can we be so sure? What's the ultimate ground on which our Christian hope, the hope of glory, rests? Well, it's, it is in the steadfast love of God. And that is what is elaborated on in verse 6 through 11. And we're going to develop this. So let's read verse 5 through 11. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So those verses, 5 through 11, are all about the security we have. Our hope will not disappoint us. And the, the basis for that security the, on which it rests is the steadfast love of God. The reason our hope will never let us down is that God will never let us down. His love will never give us up. Well, how can we be sure of God's love? Well, the Apostle Paul spells out two major means by which we come to be sure. We can be sure that God loves us. Okay? Look at them. Point A, God has poured his love into us by the gift of the Holy Spirit. It says, God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given to us. By the way, this is the first mention of the Holy, in the book of Romans of the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a Christian and it teaches us some important lessons. The Holy Spirit is God's gift to all believers. The Holy Spirit is given to us at the time that we are saved. And having been given to us, one of the Holy Spirit's distinctive ministries is to pour God's love into our hearts. Now stop and think about that for a minute. It says God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given to us. Listen, he's not ta that's not talking about our love for God. In other words, God has poured out his love into our hearts so that, so that we love him more. That's not what this is talking about. It's not our love for God that's being emphasized there. He says, God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given. So it's not talking about our love for God. Secondly, it's not talking about our love for other people. In other words, God's poured, God has poured out his love into our hearts so that we love other people. Now that may be true, but that's not what that's talking about here. That's not the intent of the author here. What it's talking about is this. Here's the New, Li New Living translation. Translation of verse 5. We know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. This passage is talking about God's love for us has been poured out into our hearts. That's so, that's so exciting. We know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love so that we know as his children that he loves us. It's very similar to what he says in Romans 8. Go back over there to verse 15 and 16. Romans 8, verses 15 and 16. Very similar to this. Uh, 
Another passage about the Holy Spirit. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. The spirit of sonship. And by him we cry what? Abba, Father. Okay? The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit in our lives is that he testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. He's poured out his love for us into our hearts. He assures us of his love. That's the idea there. So after you receive the spirit of the Holy Spirit, after you get saved, you will sense that God loves you. As we walk in fellowship with the Lord. Okay? This is not a vague mystical feeling that somebody up there cares about humanity. I'm not talking about that. That vague general concept that you can't measure. I'm not talking about that. But the deep-seated conviction that a personal God really loves you as an individual. God truly loves me. His spirit pours out his love into our hearts and testifies that we are the children of God. So that's one of the ways we know that our hope of future glory will never, dis be, dis will never be disappointed. It will happen. First, because God has poured out his love into our hearts. And then secondly, secondly, because God has proved his love for us in the death of his son. God has proved his love for us in the death of his son. So in verses 6 through 8, look at those verses again. In verses 6 through 8 of chapter 5. What's being emphasized in these verses is the degree of God's love. The depth of God's love. That's being emphasized in these verses. Here we go. You see at just the right time. When we were still powerless. Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man. Though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners. Christ died for us. It's the depth of God's love. God has proved his love for us in the death of his son. Now, how do you measure the degree of God's love? Well, notice point one and two. You measure the degree of God's love partly by the, the costliness of the gift. Okay, the costliness of the gift that is given to the sinner. And partly by the worthiness or unworthiness of the recipient. That's how you, that's how you, you measure the degree of God's love. The costliness of the gift he gave us and the unworthiness of the recipients who received it. The more the gift costs the giver... And the less the recipient deserves it, the greater the love is seen to be. Measured by these standards, God's love in Christ is absolutely unique. For in sending his son, his son, to die for sinners, he was giving everything. His only begotten son, his only unique son, to those who deserve nothing from him except judgment. The costliness of the gift, his son, and the unworthiness of the recipients. We deserve nothing from him except his wrath. So let's look at this. Well, I already mentioned that the costliness of the gift was the gift of his son. You know, in the Old Testament, God sent prophets to speak. 
He also sometimes sent angels. But now he sent his only son, and in giving his son, he was giving himself. In addition, he gave his son to die for us. Though the sins were ours, the death was his. Substitution. That means he died as a sin offering, bearing in our place the penalty our sins deserve. Salvation is free, but it's certainly not cheap. By the way, Hebrews 10 makes a big deal of that. That God is not going to allow us or allow, allow people to trample on, to tread upon the blood of his son. There's another way we measure the degree of God's love, and that's by the unworthiness of the recipients. Look at this passage. We for whom God made this costly sacrifice are portrayed by four descriptive terms. How are we portrayed in verse 6, 7, and 8? Well, first of all, we're called what? Sinners. See, he says, very rarely will anyone... Oh, yeah, while we were still sinners, the end of verse 8, Christ died for us. We're called sinners. That means that we have departed from the way of righteousness. We have fallen short of God's standard and missed the mark. The second descriptive term of our unworthiness, we are, we are ungodly. Instead of loving God with all our being, we have rebelled against him. It, ungodliness is an attitude toward God. It describes a lack of reverence for Devotion to and worship of the true God. A, fa a failure that inevitably leads to some form of false worship. Practically, it may be defined as living one's everyday life with little or no thought of God. In all decisions we make, there's no consideration. We don't think about him. We don't turn to his word. We don't talk to him. We just live our lives. That's ungodliness. There's no thought of God, of God's will, of God's glory, of one's dependence on God. God is essentially irrelevant in a godless person's life. So we are sinners and we're ungodly. Thirdly, he says we're God's enemies. God's enemies. And that's in verse, I'm jumping down to verse 10 now, for if when we were God's enemies. And it means that we cherished a deep-seated hostility to God, a resentment of his authority. And we were not only, God was not only our enemy, we were God's enemies. And then the fourth descriptive term is, we were still powerless. Verse 6, we were still powerless. In other words, we were helpless to rescue ourselves. So there we have it. Sinners, ungodly, enemies, Powerless. This is the Apostle Paul's ugly fourfold portrayal of us, yet it is for us that God's Son died. The costliness of the gift, the unworthiness of the recipient. So, here's how you can translate these verses Romans 5, 7, and 8. And I've, what you see in yellow is kind of like an elaboration of the phrase. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man. Now, what do you mean a righteous man? A holy man, okay? Probably referring to somebody whose uprightness, whose righteousness, whose holiness is rather cold, clinical, and unattractive. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man. Though for a good man whose goodness is warm, generous, and appealing, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God, notice the stark contrast is underlined, but God demonstrates, proves his own love for us, a love distinct from every other love, a love uniquely God's own. He demonstrates his love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Neither good nor righteous, but ungodly, enemies, hostile, and powerless. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
So God has proved his love for us in the death of his son. And then one last thing I want to say here, point C, and that is this. God's love will secure our final salvation. God's love is going to secure our final salvation. The, the hope and the glory of God will not disappoint. This hope will not disappoint us. It won't fail to come, won't fail to be achieved. God's love will secure our final salvation. Now, in verses 9 through 11, Paul argues from the lesser to the greater. Okay? The first thing he does is this. If God saved us when we were his enemies, okay, think about that. If God saved us when we were his enemies, surely he'll keep on saving us now that we are his children. Does that make sense? He argues from the lesser to the greater. If God saved us when we were his enemies, surely he'll keep on saving us now that we're his children. Hope will not disappoint us. That's what he says. Verse 9, since we have now been justified by his blood, he saved us, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him, in other words, we now belong to him and his family, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? So, if God saved us when we were his enemies, surely he'll keep on saving us now that we are his children. There is a wrath to come, but no true believer will ever experience it. Paul, fur Paul further argued that Christ's death, from, from Christ's death to his life, he says, if Christ's death accomplished so much for us, if his death did that, how much more will he do for us now that he is alive and intercedes for us in heaven? Because he lives, we are eternally saved and secure. I love those things. That argument from the lesser to the greater. Well, let me just share with you some... I call them some practical applications about all these things. So these are the blessings of, um, uh, you know, justification by faith. And that's been the emphasis in chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Some practical applications, and that is this. Look, the reality is we are all living between right now. We are all living between what has been called the already and the not yet, okay? Okay, we've been saved. I've been, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You have too. We've been saved. We're justified. We belong to God's family. But guess what? We're still, we're still, we're still in sin-cursed bodies. We still have a fallen nature. We're still not in heaven yet. We're not glorified yet. We're between the already and the not yet. And so we're in the middle here. We're in the middle. We belong to God. We're the children of God. The world doesn't recognize us just like it didn't recognize Jesus. And we're saved. We're declared righteous. But we're still aging. And we're still we're susceptible to death and disease and sickness and all kinds of things. We're kind of in the middle between the already and the not yet. And I'll tell you what, get, being in the middle sometimes can get confusing. Christians sometimes struggle in the middle. It's easy to get lost. It's easy to get confused. This world is utterly broken. Sin has left this world in a sorry condition. You see it everywhere you look. And so, one of the problems it is, number one, many of us live in a permanent state of location amnesia. 
we forget where we're at. We've forgotten where we live. Here and now is not the destination. It's preparation for the destination. But we forget that in the middle. It gets confusing. We can get lost. If we forget the, our location. And, that, and, and that's what happens. This broken, sin-cursed world is in the process of rescue and restoration. People are being rescued and restored to the image of God. Even creation itself is going to be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. In the meantime, we're groaning, Paul says, Romans 8. We're groaning, waiting for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, So we belong, we're children of God. We've been reconciled to God. We've been purchased. We've been brought to him. We're in his family. He is our father. We are his children. We're heir. We're heirs of God. Heirs. Joint heirs with Jesus Christ. He's the son of God by nature. We're the sons of God by adoption. The children of God by adoption. We belong to the Lord and he loves his own. But sometimes, because we're in the middle, uh, we not only have location amnesia, but we can also get and deal with identity amnesia. Number two, we're justified, but we're not glorified yet, so believer, watch out for identity amnesia. We forget who we are. Children of God. Blood-bought. De declared righteous. Special to the Lord whom he, he, he loves. We can, we, we, can, we can lose, we can have identity amnesia. And that leads to, by the way, to trying to find our identity and who we are in other places. It leads to identity replacement. Sometimes we look for our identity in this world in our achievements. I, in other words, I am my success. I am my own success. I find identity in achievement. Sometimes we try to find our identity in relationships. Identity in acceptance. From parents, in marriage from children, you know, whatever. that We find identity in our relationships. I am my relationships. Or it's, how about this one? I am my righteousness, identity in performance. Or I, I am my possessions, identity in possessions and physical things. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that, I am my job. I am my cars. I am my looks. <laughs> well, not you, Dave, but. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, but I mean, I'm serious about this. We're in the middle. And it, it can get confusing. We can get lost. We lose who we, who we are, who we belong to. What's coming? Amnesia, location amnesia, identity amnesia, identity replacement. And listen, all identity replacements are a delusion. They result in disappointment, emptiness, even despair. Life in the middle can really get confusion, can confusing. And when we're not, when we're not remembering who we are, we're not remembering where we are. We can really get we can really get messed up, and confused, and lost, even as believers. There's a lot of people in that situation. So we need to be careful. Okay, some practical applications of um, 
we're secure in Christ, we have all these wonderful blessings. All right. Now we're going to come, now we're going to come here on the last page, page number three, to this fourth section right here. Let me go back. Let's see, there it is. A righteousness from God provided, okay? What has God done about the world's problem? We saw what the problem was in the first three chapters. And we've, looked, we've been looking at these four parts, but the last part, Romans 5, 12 through 21, the Apostle Paul summarized his, his argument to the point. In other words, from chapter 118 to chapter 5, verse 11, these two major sections, he summarizes his argument to this point. What's wrong with the world, sin, what has God done about the world's problem, salvation or a savior? Now he's going to sum it up. Look at my note there. In this passage, Paul explores the contrast between two Adams. The first man, Adam, of Genesis chapters 1 to 3, and the last Adam, Jesus Christ. And by the way, he's called that in 1 Corinthians 15.45. Two Adams. Adam of Genesis chapters 1 through 3, and the last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ. Adam introduced sin and death into the world when he fell. Christ, the last Adam, brought righteousness and life. Adam, by his sin, brought universal ruin on humanity. Jesus Christ, through one righteous act, brought universal blessing. These two men sum up the message of the book up to this point. Adam stands for man's condemnation. That's the first three chapters. What's wrong with the world? The righteousness of God needed. Adam stands for man's condemnation. Christ stands for the believer's justification. The righteousness of God provided. What has God done about the world's problem? Now... I want to warn you now, this passage is complex. Okay, that's the fill-in. This passage is somewhat complex. That's what Warren Wearsby calls it, complex. John MacArthur uses the word enigmatic, meaning obscure, mysterious. It's something hard to understand or explain. It, it just You'll see what I mean when we read it. it. It's a series of contrasts, back and forth, back and forth. But I summed it up right there. That's a pretty good summary. All right? To boil it all down and make things quite simple, the passage focuses on two acts of these two men. Okay? The condemning act of Adam, which brought sin into the world and death into the world, and the redemptive act of Christ. Okay? So let's read the passage. Okay? Look at verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, who was that? Adam, right, the Genesis. Uh, sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all men because all sinned. For before the law was given... Sin was in the world. But sin is not taken into account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Again, the gift of God is not like the result of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, 
how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. The law was added so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now that's, that's some passage, isn't it? You have to read that a few times, and you have to read it in different translations. That's what they mean when they say enigmatic, complex. It's to boil it all down, he's contrasting what came to us through Adam and what comes to us through Jesus Christ. And just keeps going back and forth. So let's get started and break it down. To boil it all down and make things quite simple, the passage focuses on two acts of two men. The first act is this. Let's think about the condemning act of Adam. The condemning, condemning act of Adam. What was the act of Adam? that brought condemnation. What was it? This, yeah, yeah, this rebellion, disobedience against God. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that you eat of it, you will die. They ate it. That's the condemning act of Adam. And one trespass in the garden. One trespass in the garden brought, first of all, sin into the world. Let me go down here. One trespass in the garden brought sin into the world. And as, and as a result of Adam's sin, sin is in the world... Number one, Adam's sin has been imputed to us collectively. Adam's sin has been imputed to us collectively. We are all guilty. The whole human race, everyone that is ever born, is guilty because of Adam's sin. We sinned in Adam. His sin has been imputed to the whole human race collectively. Because we were all in him. And not only that, but number two, Adam's sinful nature has been passed on to us individually. That's the fill-in. Adam's sin has been imputed to us collectively. And Adam's sinful nature has been passed on to us individually. We inherit it. We in, I don't know what I did. We inherit it from our parents. Okay, so, yeah, you know, uh, yeah, we inherit it. So, so, mom and dad pass it on to their kids. That's why Jeremiah said, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Psalm 51.5, I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. We inherit a sinful nature. But in addition to that, it's not only that we actually inherit a sinful nature, the whole human race collectively are guilty because of Adam's sin. His sin has been imputed to the whole, all of us collectively. And we have actually received a sin nature. So we do not start life from the moment of conception, we do not start life with even the possibility of living sinlessly. 
We begin it with a sinful nature which we inherit from our parents. And what that means is this. Um, the Bible teaches that children are not good by nature. They are not a blank slate. They're not born a blank slate. They're not born innocent. They're not a blank slate upon which we can write our values. They are not inherently innocent, nor are they genetically predisposed to be good. They're not genetically predisposed to be good. And they're not a blank slate and inherently innocent. In fact, the Bible teaches that they are genetically predisposed to be bad because every child is born with original sin and a, a rebellious nature. That's what Psalm 51 means when it says, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Charles Spurgeon said this, Beware of no man more than yourself. We carry our worst enemies within us. Beware of no man more than yourself. We carry our worst enemies within us. That's what Psalm 51 meant when it says, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin. My mother conceived me. So that's really serious, folks. And that's chapters 1 through 3. Remember, he's summing this up. So, you know, what, what's interesting about all this is uh, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can fathom it? Who can understand it? Who can explain it? The heart, the inner person, our nature, who we are. You know, we don't talk much about the heart in modern Western culture the heart, the inner man, as the Bible describes it, isn't given serious attention. It's been replaced by determinism. And there are two kinds of determinism that most people accept. There's the environmental or experiential determinism, which means it says that you are the product of your environment. Or that you are what your experience has made you. That's determinism. Yeah, it's really big. You're, you're the product of your environment. Change your environment, you'll be, a, you'll, you'll be the good person that you truly, really are. And experiential determinism. Another one, huh? And the answer is we need another program, throw more tax money in education, just keep tax, taxing, $6,000, $7,000 per student per year. Yeah. In the national budget, yeah. And now it's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's determinism. Environmental, experiential. Here's another one. Biological, physiological determinism. And that posits that your behavior is caused and controlled by biochemical processes within your body. Now, I'm not saying that sin has not affected our environment, right? I'm not saying that sin hasn't affected our experiences and the horrible things people live through and in, in their growing up in families. And I'm not saying that the, the curse of sin hasn't affected our biology and our chemistry. Our bodies are broken and they're sin cursed. I'm not saying that. I'm not denying that. It's true, our environment influences us, as does the operation of our body, but neither has the power to bypass the heart. The heart is deceitful. That's where the real problem is. That's why the proverb says, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Guard your heart. Because all kinds of things are going to come your way. Environment, 
experience, what happens with our bodies. Guard your heart because that's what determines how you're going to respond to those things. For out of it is the wellspring of life. So, and then we're going to have to stop there. It's 8 o'clock, and I know that's kind of abrupt, but that's where we're going to have to stop. And we'll pick it up there and finish this out, this, this passage in Romans chapter 5. All right, heavy stuff, but this is, this is in this last section where he summarizes the whole, all from chapter 1, verse 18, right up through chapter 5, verse 11, is now being summarized. So let's pray. Our Father, thank you so much that we can be able to understand the scriptures. Thank you for these awesome thoughts and truths about the realities of life in a fallen world. But most of all, thank you that you have provided. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. Thank you, Lord, for that special gift. It's so awesome. It's so amazing. And to think that we receive it by faith, by trust. And we're thankful that I, I trust all here tonight know you as personal Savior and Lord. In Jesus' name I pray.